his people offered to him, his people offered to accept him as their king, and to lay all the riches of the land at his feet, if only he would leave the preaching of his religion. But he chose to refuse their tempting offers, and to go on preaching his religion, single-handedly, in the face of all kinds of insults, social, social boycotts, and even physical assault by his own people. Was it not only God's support and his firm will to disseminate the message of Allah and his deep-rooted belief that ultimately Islam would emerge as the only way of life for humanity, that he stood like a mountain in the face of all opposition and conspiracies to eliminate him? Furthermore, had he come with a design of rivalry with the Christians and the Jews, why should he have made belief in Jesus Christ and Moses and other prophets of God, may the peace of Allah be upon all of them, a basic requirement of faith without which no one could be a Muslim? Is it not an incontrovertible proof of his prophethood that in spite of being unlettered and having led a very normal and quiet life for 40 years, when he began preaching his message, all of Arabia stood in awe and wonder and was bewitched by his wonderful eloquence and oratory. It was so much this that the whole legion of Arab poets, preachers and orators, the highest caliber, failed to bring forth its equivalent. And above all, how could he then pronounce truths of a scientific nature contained in the Quran that no other human being could possibly have developed at that time? Last but not least, why did he lead a hard life, even after gaining power and authority? Just ponder over the words he uttered while dying. We, the community of the prophets, are not inherited. Whatever we leave is for charity. For the matter of fact, Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is the last link of the chain of prophets sent in different lands and times since the very beginning of the human life on this planet. With greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and astounding results are the three criteria of human genius. Who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad? The most famous men created arms, laws, and empires only. They founded, if anything at all, no more than material powers, which often crumbled away before their eyes. This man moved not only armies, legislations, empires, peoples, and dynasties, but millions of men in one third of the then inhabited world. And more than that, he moved the altars, the gods, the religions, the ideas, the beliefs, and souls. His forbearance and victory, his ambition, which was entirely devoted to one idea and in no manner striving for an empire, his endless prayers, his mystic conversations with God, his death and his triumph after death, all these attest not to an imposture, but to a firm conviction which gave him the power to restore a dogma. This dogma was twofold, the unity of God and the immateriality of God, the former telling what God is, the latter telling what God is not the one overthrowing false gods with the sword, the other starting an idea with the words. Philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational dogmas, of a cult without images, a founder of twenty terrestrial empires, and of one spiritual empire, that is Muhammad. As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? This is by Lamartine, History de la Turquie, Paris, 1854, Volume 2, pages 276 to 77. It is not the propagation, but the permanency of, of his religion that deserves our wonder. The same pure and perfect impression which he engraved at Mecca and Medina is preserved. After the revolutions of 12 centuries by the Indian, the African, and the Turkish proselytes of the Quran, the Mohammedans have uniformly withstood the temptation of reducing the object of their faith and devotion to a level with the senses and imagination of man. I believe in one God, and Muhammad, the apostle of God, is the simple and invariable profession of Islam. The intellectual image of the deity has never been degraded by any visible idol. The honors of the Prophet have never transgressed the measure of human virtue, and his living precepts have restrained the gratitude of his disciples within the bounds of reason and religion. This is by Edward Gibbon and Simon Ockley in the History of the Saracen Empire, published in London in 1870, page 54. He was Caesar and Pope in one, but he was Pope without Pope's pretensions, Caesar without the regions of Caesar, without a standing army, without a bodyguard, without a palace, without a fixed revenue. 
If ever any man had the right to say that he ruled by the right divine, it was Muhammad. For he had all the power without its instruments and without its supports. This is Bosworth Smith in Muhammad and Muhammadanism. Published in London, 1874, page 92. It is impossible for anyone who studies the life and character of the great prophet of Arabia, who knows how he taught and how he lived, to feel anything but reverence for that mighty prophet, one of the great messengers of the Supreme. And although in what I put to you I shall say many things which may be familiar to, familiar to many, yet I myself feel, whenever I reread them, a new way of admiration, a new sense of reverence for that mighty Arabian teacher. This was written by Ani Bassant in The Life and Teachings of Muhammad, published in Madras, 1932, page 4. His readiness to undergo persecutions for his beliefs, the high moral character of the men who believed in him and looked up to him as their leader, and the greatness of his ultimate achievement, all argue his fundamental integrity. To suppose Muhammad an imposter raises more problems than it solves. Moreover, none of the great figures of history is so poorly appreciated in the West as Muhammad. This is written by W. Montgomery Watt in Muhammad at Mecca, published in Oxford, 1953, page 52. Muhammad, the inspired man who founded Islam, was born about AD 570 into an Arabian tribe that worshipped idols. Orphaned at birth, he was always particularly solicitous of the poor and needy, the widow and the orphan, the slave and the downtrodden. At 20, he was already a successful businessman, and soon became director of camel caravans for a wealthy widow. When he reached 25, his employer, recognizing his merit, proposed marriage. Even though she was 15 years older, he married her, and as long as she lived, remained a devoted husband. Like almost every major prophet before him, Muhammad fought shy of serving as the transmitter of God's word, sensing his own inadequacy. But the angel commanded, read. So far as we know, Muhammad was unable to read or write. But he began to dictate those inspired words, which would soon revolutionize a large segment of the earth. There is one God. In all things, Muhammad was profoundly practical. When his beloved son Ibrahim died, an eclipse occurred, and rumors of God's personal condolence quickly arose. Whereupon Muhammad is said to have announced, an eclipse is a phenomenon of nature. It is foolish to attribute such things to the death or birth of a human being. At Muhammad's own death, an attempt was made to deify him. But the man who was to become his administrative successor killed the hysteria with one of the noblest speeches in religious history. If there are any among you who worship Muhammad, he is dead. But if it is God you, you worship, he lives forever. This is written by James A. Michener in Islam, The Misunderstood Religion, published in the Reader's Digest, American edition, for May 1955, pages 68 to 70. My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others, but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular level. This was written by Michael H. Hart, The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history. It was published in New York by the Hart Publishing Company, Incorporated, in 1978, page 33. What they say about the Quran. Humanity has received the divine guidance only through two channels. Firstly, the word of Allah, secondly, the prophets who were chosen by Allah to communicate his will to human beings. These two things have always been going together, and attempts to know the word of Allah by neglecting either of these two have always been misleading. The Hindus neglected their prophets and paid all attention to their books that proved only word puzzles which they ultimately lost. Similarly, the Christians, in total disregard for the book of Allah, attached all importance to Christ, and thus not only elevated him to divinity, but also lost the very essence of Tawheed, monotheism, belief in one God, contained in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the main scriptures revealed before the Quran, that is, the Old Testament and the Gospel, came into book form long after the days of the prophets, 